From the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. Regardless of the technologies with which we engage, we engage with them as human beings. And we will continue to need students, people in our society, who are deeply human and who know how to think well, reason well, live well, who are wise and virtuous. This is your host, Scott Bertram. Welcome to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. That was Dr. David Diener, Assistant Professor of Education here at Hillsdale College. We talk in depth today about the topic of education and technology. Dr. Diener, thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Speaking today on the topic of education and technology, let's define a little bit of what we'll be talking about. When we say educational technologies, what do we mean by that phrase? Well, on the one hand, we mean technologies that are used within the context of education. Uh, So uh, things like computers, uh, pencils, et cetera, <laughs> right? Uh, anything that's used within the classroom or within the school or in educational context. And then I think there's also a question having to do with purpose that has to do with what are ways in which education prepares students for life in a technological world that are important to ask as well. Why is there such a push today for educational technologies to be used in schools and used in classrooms? Sometimes you even hear schools bragging about, oh, this classroom has smart boards and we're completely linked up to the internet, can do all these things. Why is there a push for those educational technologies in some some quarters? Sure. In, interestingly, uh, when we're talking about educational technology in that context, we're usually talking about digital technology. I mean, I jokingly say, you know, pencils are technology. Sure. Flush toilets are technology. <laughs> electric lights are technology. But but we're usually talking about the, the some of the things that you mentioned. So I think there's a, a cynical answer that's probably partly true. And then there's a, a more theoretical answer. The, the cynical answer is this is good money. Okay. So educational tech is a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And all of the main tech companies, you know, you think of Apple or Google, et cetera, they have whole divisions that are dedicated to quote unquote educational technology. And it's, and, and again, this is a cynical view, but, but there is some truth here. Uh, they are selling their products in, in vast numbers and they are hooking people from a very early age uh, on their products and getting them used to them, which obviously has a long-term benefit. So th- there's that, that's part of the reality is that a lot of the push for uh, educational technology is coming from people who are very self-interested in this, not from the deeply committed educators who really believe that this is valuable. Okay, that's that's one answer. Uh, another answer that that I think is also very true has to do with the way that we as a society view technology, and and we as a society uh, often uh, I would argue deify technology in the sense that we think it's an un- we we treat it as an unquestioned. Good. Good. Mm-hmm. We assume that more speed, more you know, uh, connectivity, fewer wires, more memory, better screens, that these things are somehow intrinsically good. And so therefore, I think a lot of educational technology gets implemented, whether it ends up being helpful or not, and, and it can go both ways, because we just assume that these are good things. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, it's better to do it with a screen than with a, you know, a book or whatever the case may be. Can these educational technologies that we've described in classrooms form somewhat of a barrier between teacher and students or even a barrier between student and student? Absolutely. And and I do just want to say, Scott, that there are valuable and good uses for educational technologies. Mm-hmm. So uh, I tend to think uh, and talk more about the problematic aspects because I think as a society, we often miss those. But I certainly don't want to give the perspective that there aren't valuable uses. So so that said, yes, uh, these technologies often do form barriers. I think that education 
And throughout history, education has been understood as a deeply human, intimately human process where you have a a teacher and a student or students who are engaging together in this process of exploration, of of discovery, of learning. Uh, And that's what education is. And so the relationships between teacher and students or between students and students uh, in the community of learners are a very valuable part of the educational process. And what can tend to happen when you start inserting some of these educational technologies in is that the teacher becomes a sort of mere technician or facilitator, Mm -hmm. right? And and that deeply human connection of, of a master teacher leading out students on this journey of learning can be lost or in some ways truncated. So you did say there are some valuable uses. How would you describe a proper role that uh, technological instruction should play in education? So I think that what's really important is that we ask that question and think about it intentionally. One of the one of the really interesting things that has happened is that as school districts or, or different sectors add ad- educational technologies, they do it oftentimes almost blind to the actual effects that it has. And and there's research that shows this or that, you know, sometimes there are marginal increases. Sometimes the infusion of educational technologies actually decreases certain kinds of student learning. And but if you think about this, in what other sector or in what other aspect of education would we say, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's spend a billion plus dollars to give, you know, for example, every student in the Los Angeles school system an iPad. Hmm. And Well, is there good data that this billion plus investment is going to have the kind of effect we want? Well, no, but it's really cool. And look at all this stuff we could do. In other words, we unthinkingly assume that there are benefits that sometimes there are, but oftentimes there aren't. Should the goal of education be informed by the fact that we live in a society driven largely by technology. What about parents who fear that their children will be behind the curve when it comes to using devices or knowing about technology that they might have to use later in life? It's a great question. The the short answer is yes, we should be concerned about it or we should think about it, but it often doesn't yield the answer that I think people assume. So if the goal of education is to form a certain kind of human being, Okay, uh, which throughout history has been understood as the as the purpose of education here at Hillsdale College. We are part of that long tradition of classical liberal arts education. So, the the goal of education is to to help to cultivate a person who is able to live well, to live a virtuous and wise life uh, as an individual and in the context of their their family, their civic society, their church, etc. So, if you have those deeply human goals. Technology in in our contemporary age is a part of life. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's relevant to what does it mean to live well. But the answer you give or the way that you think about the role of technology, if you understand the purpose of education that way, is very different than if you think about the purpose of education primarily as technical job training Mm -hmm. or something like that. In which case, yes, if you're going to in two years or four years or 12 years, depending on the context, if, if our goal is to prepare you to go out and get job X, then we should be teaching you the technology for job X. If on the other hand, our our primary purpose is to teach you or to help you become a certain kind of human being who interacts with technology well, that is going to lead to different kinds of practical implications in terms of the ways that we will engage with technology. Talking with Dr. David Diener, he is Assistant Professor of Education at Hillsdale College about education and technology. Is it possible that when we think about education, the the technology provides too many easy answers, meaning that it it deters students and others from thinking critically and perhaps preventing key classroom conversations? Yes. So we know there's great research on this that, that tech companies don't often publish, but there's a lot of great research that shows that things like, for example, reading comprehension, I'll just use this as an example, are much better when you're holding and reading from a physical book than when you're looking at a screen. When you're holding a physical book, uh, you there's a tactile 
the sense that's involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're looking at a right hand and a left hand page. Your your fingers are feeling that you're at the front or the back of the book or in the middle. There are smells that that actually help to embed memories. And so when you're you know scrolling across a screen, all of that, all of those uh, sort of indicators or, or hooks are lost. We have lots of great research that reading comprehension and memory recall of what you've read are greater when you've read a physical book than when you've looked at it on a screen. And so the question then would be, what are ways in which some of these digital technologies or screen technologies are actually precluding us from engaging in these more difficult things. Uh, Neil Postman quipped one time, he's talking about television in this context, but he said, he said, you know, reading is really difficult. Uh, You get better at reading over years as you read more and more difficult texts. Some people have, you know, reading disabilities and it's just, this is a struggle for them. Mm -hmm. He said the, the cognitive requirements of watching television are so low that in the history of the world, no one has been diagnosed with a television watching disability. Okay. (laughs) Now take that for what it's worth, but I think a similar kind of idea can be applied in this context. Um, Swiping a screen surfing the internet, scrolling through with a mouse. These are very low cognitive demand skills. And so what often happens in educational contexts is that some of these technologies um, are, are cultivating in students a set of skills, which they may need later on, but that precious time within the classroom or at home is being used in a way that is not as impactful educationally as if they were engaging in, let's say, more traditional kinds of educational activities. We'll be back with Dr. David Diener in just a moment, talking more about education and technology. But in addition to being the host of this show, I'm also the director of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. Now, this show and all the other shows on the network are listener-supported. That means we hope for and we count on, we rely on, the support of listeners like you to make our educational outreach possible. One of the best and most convenient ways is to join the Liberty and Learning Society. That's our exclusive monthly giving group. When you join, and most people give around $25 a month, you'll help to defend liberty through education. Month in, month out, 365 days a year. And thankfully, you'll make shows like this one possible far into the future. Your automatic gift will help us reach and teach millions of Americans every month through podcasts like these, through free online courses, in Primus, and much more. Joining is simple and easy. You can cancel any time. All you have to do is visit hillsdale.edu slash monthly and complete the secure online donation form. If you have to pause or stop your gift at any point, just call us and one of our friendly students or staff will help you out. I hope you'll consider joining our monthly giving club. It's the Liberty and Learning Society at hillsdale.edu slash monthly. Do it today. hillsdale.edu slash monthly and join the Liberty and Learning Society here at Hillsdale College. We continue with Dr. David Diener, Assistant Professor of Education here at Hillsdale College, talking about education and technology. Dr. Diener. I was talking to a, a history teacher a while ago and discussing the amount of film that's available around World War II, the battles. And I said, it must be, must be useful to use that in class. And he said, I, I'm not sure. I like the students to put themselves in those locations, to read, to think about what happened and to create these images in their mind and put themselves in that place. To that end, Educational technologies, do they have an impact on a student's ability to be creative and an ability to to imagine? Yes. And again, just to be clear, those technologies, whether it's films of World War II or whatever the case may be, I think do have a a valuable and appropriate role. Mm -hmm. But I think that history teacher that you talked to was on to something. And, And again, think of what happens just in the act of reading. When you're reading something... You are taking the idea or the image that someone else had, the author, that that author then translated into this little series of symbols and squiggles on a page. And when you are reading those, you're then decoding that from the squiggles to the words to the meaning of the overall thing. And you are forming in your mind 
an image. And this is why, or, or, or a concept, this is why when you have multiple p- people read a same text, mm-hmm. they might form different images. In mm-hmm. other words, cognitively, neurologically, there is creativity that's happening, even in the, just the very simple act of reading. When you look at a photograph or you watch a, a, a video, right, you, something like that, those cognitive skills are not required. It's simply presented to your mind. And so the kind of analysis and interpretation uh, doesn't happen. Uh, you can't argue discursively with a photograph mm-hmm. or a movie. It just is what it is, right? right? So um, so yeah, it is a different kind of skill. Again, not that it's not valuable in certain contexts, but but I think we're selling our students short a lot of times by not requiring as much of them and 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 shaping their minds as we could. And a final comment on this point: again, a lot of work has has been done and is being done on neuroplasticity and the way in which the kinds of technologies or or engagements educationally that we have, it's not only what's happening right there; it's actually the way in which it wires the brain for future. Uh, for future engagement. Mm-hmm. So things like attention spans, for example, uh, are are quantitatively and demonstrably measurably being reduced by the kinds of technologies that we're engaging with. Your eyes move differently across a page of text than they do down a computer screen, for example. Yeah. The classical liberal arts education, the kind that is offered in our Hillsdale K-12 schools, the kind that we talk about and provide to our students here at Hillsdale College, how does a classical liberal arts education, how is it uniquely important in the kind of technological society in which we live? It's incredibly important because regardless of the technologies with which we engage, we engage with them as human beings. And we will continue to need students, people in our society who are deeply human and who know how to think well, uh, reason well, live well, uh, who, who are wise and virtuous. One of the really interesting things is the way that we're seeing industry leaders within highly technological fields, you know, STEM fields, let's say, uh, call for these deeply human skills. So you have industry leaders saying things like, look, today's college graduates may know all of these computer coding languages, but they don't know how to think. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to work with their colleagues. They don't know how to engage in our company in a meaningful and productive way. They don't know how to write. They don't know how to learn. All they've been taught is this set of technical skills as though all that the human being is, is a kind of technological automaton that you can plug in. And so these industry leaders, even in very technological fields, very techie fields are saying, we need people who have these deeply human abilities that, as you said, a classical liberal arts approach to education, like the one we believe in here at Hillsdale College, are, are cultivating. And then you can learn those technological skills. You know, another uh, another way of thinking of this, when I was a headmaster, of, of K-12 schools, I would always ask parents when they would ask this question about, you know, what kind of technologies do you use in the classrooms? And I was basically say, well, lights and pencils and <laughs> books, you know, those are all technologies. Uh, but, but think about this. When your five-year-old child is graduating from high school or graduating from college or in their 50s making a career change, right? Is the iPad going to be the thing that they really need in order to be successful or pick whatever, you know, gadget du jour you want? And so a school system that says, oh, look, we're preparing your your five-year-old for this technological society by giving them a Chromebook or whatever the current technology of today is, is completely missing the point that in 10, 20, 50 years, those technologies are going to be radically different. What we need is people who know how to think about technology, who know how to learn, who have the communication skills, the thinking skills, the learning skills that will enable them to adapt and think thrive within those technological contexts. And so ironically, I would argue the best way to prepare students for life in a technological age is precisely by focusing on those deeply human things and not spending so much time on the specific technological devices of today. Final question for uh, Dr. David Diener as we talk about education and technology Do you see a pushback on some of these technologies or the uses of these technologies 
uh, in classrooms, specifically in a post-COVID world in which parents got a look at how perhaps Zoom teaching was working for their children. Is that a healthy reaction to what we saw during the COVID years of education? I think in many ways, COVID uh, showed people, well, it showed parents what their students were or were not being taught. But I do think it also showed people that a kind of purely technological medium of education loses certain deeply human aspects that we actually really care about. And so it was a kind of test case where I think a lot of people saw, oh, wait a minute, my my 16-year-old sitting on their bed for days at a time staring at a screen is not actually great education uh, beyond just a question of does the actual is the program working well or some of these technical things. So yes, I think that's a very valuable thing. Also, the emergence of artificial intelligence is raising some of these questions as well. Like, wait a minute, (laughs) hold on. You know, we like using technology, but artificial intelligence has the potential to, in many ways, undermine the educational process by allowing students to simply generate things that they're not thinking about or producing at all. So it raises these deep questions that I think we as a society need to consider carefully. Dr. David Diener, Assistant Professor of Education at Hillsdale College, as we talk about education and technology. Dr. Diener, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you so much for having me. Up next, Jeffrey E. Paul, his brand new book, Winning America's Second Civil War, Progressivism's Authoritarian Threat, Where It Came From, and How to Defeat It. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Would you turn down millions of dollars per year? All you'd have to do is surrender your independence and abandon your principles for the money. That's a devil's bargain. Sadly, it's one that almost all American colleges and universities make. But one college in America says, no, our college, Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College refuses to accept one penny of taxpayer money, not even indirectly in the form of federal student grants and loans. By saying no to taxpayer money, we remain genuinely independent, free to pursue our original 1844 mission, pursuing truth and defending liberty. Hillsdale has over 1,500 undergraduate and graduate students on its main campus in Michigan and its satellite campus in Washington, D.C. In addition, over 3 million citizens have enrolled in our free online courses, and over 6 million American households receive our free monthly publication, Imprimus, delivered in the mail. You can learn more about Hillsdale's independence from government, its mission of defending liberty, and its national educational outreach programs at hillsdale.edu slash penny. That's hillsdale.edu slash penny. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out the Hillsdale College Podcast Network at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Find older episodes of this program and all sorts of Hillsdale College audio. We're joined by Jeffrey Paul. He's a research professor in the Social Philosophy and Policy Center of the John Chambers College of Business and Economics at West Virginia University. And his recent book is Winning America's Second Civil War. Progressivism's Authoritarian Threat, Where It Came From, and How to Defeat It. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us. Delighted to be with you. Before we dig into the book, let's give you the opportunity to explain the title, America's Second Civil War. How do you identify that? How do you describe it? I describe it in the following way. The uh, first civil war was over uh, the founding principles. Uh, The founding principles were that every human being has a natural right by virtue of his or her nature to self-ownership, liberty, and the fruits of their labor. What happened was a second civil war began about um, a decade, a little over a decade after the first. What, What most of us would have thought was that that first Civil War would have resolved the question of whether individuals had natural rights 
or not, because the North prevailed, and that's that was the central principle, the founding, of course. What happened was, after that, the college and university presidents in the United States from the top colleges decided that they wanted graduate programs, and they used as their model the German universities, which it had been granting doctoral degrees since for about 200 years at that point. And what they wanted to do was to import either Germans or Americans trained in Germany with doctorates to uh, populate uh, the universities and colleges so that they could give genuine doctoral programs in their various disciplines that would be the equal of the German universities. And that worked um, in a profound way in the natural sciences and medicine. In the social sciences and humanities, it was something of a disaster mm -hmm. because the German views were allied with those of the Confederacy. That is, human beings had no natural rights. Human beings were the cellular parts of an organism called the state or the nation. And in being parts of an organism, their duty was to keep the organ organism going and to take um, orders from the brain to do their duty to sustain the organism. They had no rights, according to this view. In order to disguise what their views were to the outside world, the world outside of the academy, they needed a name for themselves. The name that was used in Germany was a name that was that was not offensive to most people and was a term that was widely viewed in a positive way. And that was state socialism. They called themselves state socialists. I can't pronounce the German term for it, <laughs> but they couldn't use the term in the United States where socialism was a, obviously a very offensive term and in disrepute. And so they had to rename themselves, and they renamed themselves by inventing a term borrowed from the German Progress Party, and they called themselves progressives. So they have a term and a phrase. How did they explain that word to other Americans? They explained themselves as being progressives because what they believed is that History had a positive evolution, and it will always go in one trajectory, and that people like themselves, their job is, as intellectuals was to identify uh, the, the tendency which would most favor most humanities, the historical tendency, and then try to implement that tendency in the countries that they occupied. That's how they that's how they characterize themselves, but their what they kept fairly disguised until I would say the turn of the century to the 20th century was that they were total opponents of natural rights. They didn't believe humans had them, and so on. So they became as virulent opponents of the founding principles. Uh, identified by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence as the Confederacy. And their teachers in Germany, these Americans who came back, were admirers of the uh, Confederacy. They were autocratic, anti-Semitic, um, and generally racist. And so uh, with the influence of, of these of the, pro of the professors, the people who were being educated in universities, who were few in the 19th century, but were many in the 20th century, um, were educated as they would have been in Germany and would have assimilated the same political principles in the United States that they had 
assimilated in Germany. And then I'll try to try to end this at this point. Um, what happened was progressivism began to make its way into politics. That's basically, in a nutshell, what the book is about. The question is whether we have reached the point uh, in which we are really in a, we we know there's been a preface to a second civil war. The question is whether we are now in such a war uh, in which these two views confront one another and only one of them can prevail in the long run. Talking with Jeffrey Paul, his book, Winning America's Second Civil War, Progressivism's Authoritarian Threat, Where It Came From and How to Defeat It. So a couple of questions from inside the book. You quote Charles Beard saying something, I'm paraphrasing a bit, the, the Constitution, the, the argument of those uh, progressives, the Constitution was not written to protect alleged natural rights. So the, the question is, what, from their perspective, why was it written? What, what caused it to be written? What motivated the authors in their mind? What motivated the authors in their minds were the, they, they sought to protect their property. They were so motivated, and then they invented natural rights as justification. It was simply a justification to satisfy their economic appetites. That was the view. And the view wasn't they came from these rights, come from the nature of human beings, or come from God. The view was that they were motivated and had to have a pretext, a philosophical pretext. That, that was their view. Jeffrey Paul with us. Winning America's Second Civil War is his recent book. Later on, you say that at present, the most dangerous pretext for depriving Americans of natural rights is universal free health care. Why is that most dangerous? It's a danger because it seeds to the government a monopoly on health care. And those sorts of monopolies make individuals completely dependent for their health care on a government provision. And with that sort of monopoly, not only is it less available, as Medicare medical uh, services, are they less available, but frequently they are not permitted and we know of cases in England, a lot of cases in England, I cite a couple to uh, illustrate. In the case of children, they get a disease if the authorities in England say that it, their condition cannot be improved medically, but the, there are people in the United States or in other places that say, yes, it can be treated. They will not permit the, the, the parents to take the kid out of the hospital in England and take him to the United States or elsewhere. And that's the kind of danger centrally controlled and monopolized health care presents to the average person. I want to ask this because it will come back up when we talk about your, your, your solutions at the end of the book. That is, how did this type of ideology lead to income taxation without limitation, as you write in the book? Well, what happened was the first generation, the two institutions that the first generation took over immediately, and I'm talking about only in the social sciences and the humanities, were Columbia and Johns Hopkins, which mm -hmm. was founded in 1876. And uh, these these institutions had people in a variety of the social science disciplines. And at Columbia, the, the first person with a doctorate in economics was a man named E.R.A. Seligman. Before we get there, can you give us a little bit of a refresher course, a background on the history of the income tax here in the United States? Taxation in the United States in the 19th century basically was what emanated from the natural rights view. In other words, natural rights are, include the right to property, the right to, 
things you produce. And what the government is supposed to do, it's supposed to be highly limited to protecting these rights, the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to property. If it's supposed to protect your life and your property, then what follows is that taxes, which must be raised to support the activity, the legitimate activity of the government, should, should accord with what they're protecting. So basically, just as you're charged, just as you get insurance for a house and the insurance, uh, the amount of insurance that you pay um, is is correlated with the value of your house, so taxes should be correlated with the value of your assets. Therefore, in the, in the 19th century, taxation at the state level, and the states, you have to realize, were raising sometimes more, but then sometimes only slightly less than the federal government. They were they they uh, their taxes were as substantial as the those of the federal government taxation was supposed to be a tax on net worth they called it the general property tax every state had its own but basically what they were was a tax on net worth because that's what was being protected a proportional tax on net worth not a progressive one on that worth. Mm -hmm. As a federal government, the only taxes were taxes on sales. Most of them were, were uh, tariffs. They raised the most amount of money. There were also sin taxes, but they were taxes on sales. Dr. Jeffrey Paul with us. When then does that begin to change? When does income begin to play a role in this taxation? The, one, the first one in the United States was levied to fund the Civil War. The income tax was, was instituted in 1861 and ran up till 1872, uh, and there was complete opposition to it after the, after the war was over and finally terminated in 1872. It, uh, second income tax, um, was levied in 1894, and that one was found to be unconstitutional. Therefore, the Constitution had to be amended. ERA Seligman at Columbia was the principal, provided the principal arguments for that tax, and the arguments were extremely shoddy. That's all I can say. <laughs> They, uh, they, uh, they were really a series of assertions. And um, uh, Seligman argued that there wasn't any natural rights to property. Very odd for him, since he was the uh, son of a, a very wealthy man. And uh, taxes, therefore, should uh, raise money not based on the benefit that the individual receives in protecting his property, but based instead on the needs of society. And that that meant that that tax should, should accord with one's financial capabilities. Now, that would imply a net worth tax also, but it skips over that. He criticizes the practicality of having a net worth tax, um, stressing various problems that the states had or, or others had with them. And therefore, he proposed an, a progressive income tax. And he and a number of political forces within the country pressed forward with that and, uh, it was proposed in 18, excuse me, 1909, and then finally passed in uh, in, in 1913. So um, it wasn't derived by asking what accords with the natural rights that human beings have.
he was he rejected natural rights absolutely, as did all the first generation of the progressives who had had training in Germany. And then you described the most important and far-reaching reform possible is taxation at the federal level. Your proposal would repeal all sorts of personal and corporate income taxes and instead install a universal 1.13% sales tax that would be included even on sales of stocks, bonds, and derivative. derivatives. That's where a majority of the revenue would be raised. Walk us through right. that just briefly about how that would work and, and why it would work. Well, it would work because, as I explain in my book, we had economists reviewing, ultimately, we reviewed uh, the years between uh, 2011 and 2021, about 10 years. And what we found in each of those years, that that tax would exceed in revenue all of the federal planned expenditures, the budget, for each one of those years. Uh, 91% of the revenues would come from the sale of stocks and bonds. The advantage to the individual is even if one is trading in stocks and bonds and derivatives, when one sells what one has purchased with a, including the 1.13 sales tax, there is no capital gains tax. One of the possible criticisms of this system is that it might retard activity on the stock exchange and they might migrate to other exchanges. The advantage of being on the stock exchange after this universal sales tax is enacted is that while it costs you a little over 1% to buy something, you pay no taxes on the sale of it. So it's as if it was in a retirement account or other non-taxable account under the present system. And our view is that it's unlikely that people would take make their purchases elsewhere because if they did, they would not receive the benefit of a zero capital gains tax when they realized a profit on the sale of a, of a financial asset. Uh, and in fact, we found, we started off, because I started the, the book about four years ago, we started off with the year 2019, and when we, what we found in 2019, using the budget uh, that was used there, that the, um, the, it would have balanced that budget and uh, that it would have exceeded it considerably. More on that in Jeffrey Paul's new book, Winning America's Second Civil War, Progressivism's Authoritarian Threat, Where It Came From, and How to Defeat It. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Dr. David Diener from Hillsdale's Education Department and Jeffrey E. Paul, his new book, Winning America's Second Civil War. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.